morning. My name is Jody. So for those of you who are, are here for the first time or guests, um, I have been on a, a mini sabbatical and today is my first day back. So, so I missed you guys so much. I mean, the ones that I know I miss, the ones that I, never mind. But I, I just wanted to explain to you um, just kind of what led up to it. So um, my father passed away May 21st, and then uh, we had his funeral in Arizona uh, in the middle of June. And I came back after staying down there for a few days, and I just felt kind of off. Anybody who's grieved, you know what I'm talking about. There's just, you just feel something's off. And I just kind of responded too strongly to someone at one point. And I was like, whoa, where did that come from? And, and so I just, it really bothered me. I went back to that person and they were like, I don't even know what you're talking about. So that was good. But I knew there was something in me that was just not okay. So I kind of pulled a little bit of a Simone Biles. You know what I'm saying? Hey, I'm sorry to offend you if you're if you're offended by that. If you are, we need to talk about some deeper issues. But I just I just was like getting emotional twisties. You know what I'm saying? I was just something was, and and I really felt like the Holy Spirit just said, "Oh, see, I offended them." The Holy Spirit just said, "You're on the verge of burnout." So I, I listened to that, and so I I took some time away to grieve and to really seek the Lord and to spend some time in silence and in solace, which for an extreme extrovert is, is very difficult to do. But I really knew that the Lord was calling me to, to come away. And I, so I, I'm not saying this, it's not about me, but I do want to say if you are somebody who you feel like I just have to keep going and, and you know that there's something going on, today's message is really going to speak to you, I hope. Um, my prayer is really that that you would be transformed, like like it says in Romans 12, transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that your mind could be changed to such a point that your whole life would be different. And you know the Holy Spirit can do that, right? The Holy Spirit can do that in one day. So first of all, I just want to say a, a big thank you to all of the other pastors. They each took a Sunday and spoke. Um, did you guys enjoy that? Having all the different, wasn't that great? And then um, also uh, we had our illustrious Noah Lee. He spoke one Sunday. Did you guys enjoy that? <clears throat> so um, it, I, I'm really grateful to have such an amazing team around me, um, speakers and and just people who really genuinely love you. So that was pretty sweet. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about something. We're doing a little From the Heart series, and I'm talking about something that has been very significant in my life. This is something that began probably right when we moved out here in 1999 to plant the Adventure Church. And I remember going through a really, really, really hard time. And um, I was talking with a friend of mine, and she said, Jody, this is just a season. And it just hit me. It was a season. And you know, especially as someone from Minnesota, um, seasons change. And, and even though it's really hot right now, it's not going to stay hot. And even though it's winter, it's not going to stay winter. And even if it's, you know, this is, this is the glorious thing about the way that, that life goes and our journeys go. So today, I want to talk to you about seasons. And now, um, we are part of a, a larger denomination. We like to call ourselves interdenominational because we really firmly believe in the unity of the body of Christ even though we might have different expressions and maybe some little different uh, ways of thinking about passages in the Bible, we really believe in the unity of the body of Christ. That is a very important thing to the denomination that we belong to. And that denomination is called Foursquare. 
Well, our Foursquare family ha- is undergoing some really significant changes right now, and I have a new boss, and his name is Billy, Billy Calderwood. Billy is a friend of mine, and he's an amazing man. Um, he and his wife had a church called the Media City Church, and he said pretty much any show that you watch, somebody that has worked on one of those shows goes to his church. So it's like, you know, lighting people or makeup or costumes or actors or whatever. And now God has called him to be a supervisor. And so I just kind of want to introduce you to him by showing you this video. And uh, it's interesting because this was already something that was kind of on my heart. And then I saw this video. It's actually um, addressing the pastor's for whom he is responsible, the the pastors that he oversees. But I would like to introduce you to my supervisor and yours, Billy Calderwood. I'm standing in the middle of a space that is currently being renovated. It's unfinished. It's dirty. There's a lot of dust flying around. Most days around here, it's pretty loud. But there's a purpose to all this mess. There's a purpose to all this pain. There's a purpose to all this unfinished mess in the middle. When this space is fully renovated, it's going to become a production studio where music can be made, and film can be recorded, and all kinds of things can take place in this space that will look amazing and broadcast information and transformation to lots of people all over the world. Your life is like that. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's masterpiece, His workmanship, and He's created us anew in Christ, so we can do all the good things He planned for us to do long ago. I don't know what you're experiencing right now in this season of life in ministry, but I can imagine you're feeling some measure of renovation and remodeling, some deconstruction and reconstruction. Some of the old ways of God working in you and through you in your life and ministry, as wonderful as they were, they're not continuing. And God is bringing out some new things. I want to encourage you in the messy go. What God has begun, He will complete. And it will be worth it in the end. Hang with me in the messy middle. God is doing something great in your life. God is doing something great in your ministry. God is doing something great in the lives of all of us together in the Foursquare family. And right now, I want to look like this. But hang for just a little longer. You're going to see extraordinary things come to pass in your life as you yield to the renovating process of the Holy Spirit. Looking forward to being with you in person soon, friends. God bless. How many of you can relate to what Billy's saying? You feel like you're in the middle of a mess and you're being renovated and there's wires hanging, or it's, you're all dusty, and you just feel like kind of weird. Anybody? You know, it's interesting because I really think, um, obviously, we have been through something Actually, the entire world has been through something, and I don't believe there's anybody that can say that they are unchanged by the coronavirus and its effects and the things that have happened in our lives as a result. Anybody? Anybody just the same, exactly the same? Yeah, I can see that. (laughs) Um, and, And it's really been an interesting dynamic to watch what it has done to people and the division that it has brought into our nation, even into the body of Christ. And um, as I mentioned, we're really all about unity. And so today I want, I'm going to be talking with you about the seasons of life. And then I have what I believe is a prophetic word from the Lord for the Adventure Church and for uh, individuals. But we're going to start with this passage, and it comes out of the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, Ecclesiastes is a book that was written during a time when there was a lot of confusion and frustration and angst, okay? This is a book that actually, when I first came to Christ, so, so I, I got my undergraduate degree in philosophy, so as you can tell, I'm very practical, and um, that was a joke. So there are not a lot of job openings for philosophers. But, um, but this particular book, I was just coming to the Lord, and the book of Ecclesiastes really spoke to me as a philosophy major. 
Um, it's kind of deep. It's kind of, it's got, it's very philosophical. And it starts, chapter three starts with a very common passage that a lot of people have have probably heard, and it's quoted even in movies and TV shows and things that are not even Christian-based, but it starts, verse one, it says, for everything there is a season and a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to turn away, a time to search, and a time to quit searching, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be quiet, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Most people, the majority of people, hate change. Yeah, anybody here? Hate change? So researchers have have shown that 3% of the population actually initiates change. 7% are inspired by it and excited about it, but they don't initiate it. 10% will go along with it and actually embrace it, okay? So that's the 20% that likes change. Only 20% of all people actually like change. The other 80% hate it, and some so much so. Okay, so 10% will, will accept it, Oh, wait, I'm sorry. 20% will need reasons to accept it. They have to be convinced, in other words. 40% of all people, four out of 10 people, resist change at all costs. Okay? And 20% actually will not change even if they've been convinced that it's for the better. What kind of sickness is that? (laughs) Just kidding. Because I'm one of the 3%. I like to initiate change. But 80% of all people hate change. And yet, think about life. Nothing stays the same. Everything changes. There's a time to to heal. There's a time to tear down. There's a time to build up. There's a time to de-junk. There's a time to purchase. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of different seasons in life. There's going to be change in life, and yet we hate it. We resist it. We'll do anything to avoid it. 20% will even just refuse no matter what. Okay? Why is this? This goes against our human nature. You know, there's a book that I would recommend called Necessary Changes. Some of you cringe just at the title. But there is a time where you need to, to make some decisions that, that this season is over. You know, if we would have just stayed in our church in California because we hated change, we never would have come out here. We would have never followed the call of God to come here and to plant the Adventure Church, and therefore you would not be here today. I don't know where you'd be, but you wouldn't be here. There was a grief. There's always a grief that comes with change. I mean, not always. Most of the time, though. You know, when you move, there's, there's a grief that takes place. When you, when you go to a different job, you, you grieve the people. Or, you know, when your children move out of the house, there's a new season and you grieve. I mean, some of you grieve, some of you rejoice. When you, <laughs> but, <clears throat> but most people hate change. And I want to just read you this passage. It's a little tiny verse just tucked away in First Chronicles 12. And it says, the tribe of Issachar, that sometimes called the sons of Issachar, and it says that they were leaders and they understood the times and they knew the best course for Israel to take. Some, some versions say they understood the times and the seasons. So, that, so these sons of Issachar, they, they understood kind of what was going on 
what was currently happening, and therefore they knew the best course for Israel to take. And that is the main point of my message today, is know what season you're in so that you can know how you should be responding, what you should be doing, how to to further your journey, okay? So I really want you to be thinking about what season of life you might be in right now. Let me ask you, let's take a little unofficial poll. How many of you love winter? Shout out for the winter lovers. Oh, that was weak because they're frozen. (laughs) Okay, how many of you love spring? Okay, how many of you love summer? How many of you love fall? You cannot wait for that PSL. Okay, yep, let's bring out the scarves, bring out the boots, get me a pumpkin spice latte. Stat. Okay, well, we're coming up to that season. I can always tell because I'm in the pathway for the Canadian honkers to fly over. So, like, I can always tell when they start, I can always go, hey, guys. That means fall is coming. That means the seasons are going to change. Seasons change. Y'all, seasons change. Nothing will ever stay the same. They say that if you think it's staying the same, it's probably going backwards. Things change. Everything changes in our lives. So what season are you in? We're going to go through the seasons, and then we're going to talk about um, something that I do believe that the Lord has put on my heart for us. But we're going to start with winter. All right, winter is a time where it looks like it's barren, and it looks like it's desolate. It looks like everything is dead. It appears that that there's nothing growing, nothing going on. Yeah? Storms come in the winter. Okay, some of you are, are right in the middle of, of winter, and it seems like nothing is happening. I'm going to tell you uh, the story. We're going to... We're going to dive a little bit into the book of Job. Um, You know, with everything I've been through in the last five years, I I like to say that I'm writing the sequel to Job called the book of Job. Um, But winter is a time where it really, it, it, it appears that everything's dead. But let me just offer you this hope. During the winter is when all kinds of things are going on under the surface. All kinds of growth is happening. So if you're in a season of winter, I just want to encourage you. It's a season. So here we go. Job, the book of Job. I'll give you a little brief overview. Job was considered the most righteous man on the face of the earth. And he was also one of the wealthiest. And so Satan comes to God and he's like, well, yeah, of course Job is going to serve you because look at all the good stuff he has. That's the only reason he serves you. And God's like, no, that's not really the only reason because of course God knows what's in Job's heart. So Satan goes, well, let me test him. And so God says, okay, you can test him. You can't kill him. But if you, even if you take away all of that, Job is still going to serve me. Job's still going to be a righteous guy. So the first two chapters of Job is called the testing of Job. So this is what happens to him. He's just minding his own business, and all of a sudden a servant comes to him and he says, 500 of your oxen and 500 of your donkey have been raided and taken away and stolen, and all your servants. So he has one servant left. Then another guy comes to him and he goes, 7,000 of your sheep, so this is, this is like, that means money, basically. So this is his investment portfolio, who was made up of sheep and donkeys. 7,000 of your sheep died in a fire. 3,000 camels were stolen. And then the worst possible nightmare for any parent. All of Job's kids were hanging out, having dinner together, and a huge storm came and collapsed the roof, and all 10 of his children died. Unimaginable grief. It is unimaginable grief. This is what happened to Job. Remember, he's the most righteous man in the world, okay? So Job is going through it, to say the least. And Even his own, it says that he developed boils from the the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And even his wife, she's just like, Job, just curse God and die. Now think about it. His wife was also going through this. She had also lost all her wealth. She had lost her children. 
She was, she was having a hard time too. But the difference between them is Job, it says, in all of this, no matter what he went through, he never sinned with his mouth. He never spoke a word against the Lord. That's pretty incredible. You know, we get a little hangnail and we're all angry. <laughs> so Job's friends show up. Now, Job's friends, the, the smartest thing that they did was they just hung out with Job. They just chilled with him, just sat with him and listened. That was the wise thing to do. So this, just a little note to self. When people are grieving, don't try to explain it to them. Don't try to explain to them why they're grieving and what they did wrong and how they should have done something. Because this is what Job's friends did. Now, when they were just sitting there, chilling with Job, everything was good. That was good for Job. But then they started in. Then they're like, oh, well, we need it. Job, you've obviously got some secret sin, you know, or Job, it's because of this. Or, you know, they're trying to philosophize. And this, this is what always happens. It goes into legalism. It goes into this kind of letter of the law kind of thing where, well, obviously Job must have done something wrong because look how blessed he used to be and now he's not. So keep, keep this in mind, okay? So his friends are just sitting there and, and Job's like trying to defend himself. He's like, I, didn't, I really don't know what I did. If I did something, I don't know what I did. I, I really didn't, I didn't sin in any way that I know. And as a matter of fact, it says in Job, Chapter 13, verse 15. Keep this in mind next time you go through something hard. This is Job's attitude. He says, God might kill me, but I have no other hope. I'm going to argue my case with him. Some versions say, though he slay me, yet will I continue to trust in him. He says, even if God kills me, even if he puts me through the proverbial ringer, I will continue to trust in him because I know that he is good. I don't have anywhere else to go. When we're going through hard times in our winter, that is the place to go to God. But also what's interesting about this is he's like, I am going to go talk to him about this because I don't understand. And isn't that what happens when we are going through trials? We want to understand we want to know what is up with this. Like, why would God treat me like this? Anybody ever ask God why he would allow you to go through something or feel like God's abandoned you or like, let me just say this. You know, it does talk in the Psalms about um, keep me from unintentional sins. But God is able to show you if there's an area where you are sinning or you have sinned, the Holy Spirit is capable of showing you that. I don't think you have to dig too long to, to know where God is working in you. So you don't, it's not like God is not like a practical joker or an impractical joker. <laughs> God is able to speak that to you. But anyway, so back to, back to Job. This is what he says in the first verse of chapter 14. He says, how frail is humanity? How short is life? And get this, and full of trouble. I want to dispel a myth that some people hold on to. Some people actually believe you can go through life and not have trouble. <laughs> false. False, false, false. Life is full of trouble. Just get used to it. Anybody so glad you're here today? <laughs> it's true. So, so, you know, it even says in the Bible, it says, don't, you know, don't, don't freak out when you go through, well, that's, that's my version, but it says, don't freak out when you go through a hard time as though something strange were happening to you. This is happening to all believers all across the world. And it's also happening to non-believers. They just don't have any hope. Those of us who know Jesus know there is a reason I'm going through this. There is hope in the midst of this trial. Because I'll tell you something, Job didn't know the end of the story. Job had no idea how this story, he's just in it. And some of you are just in it and you are confused and you're frustrated and you don't understand what's going on. And this is what Job says. We blossom like a flower, then we wither. Like a passing shadow, we quickly disappear. Must you keep an eye on such a frail creature and demand accounting from me? You, skip to verse five, you have decided the length of our days. You know how many months we will live. 
and we are not given a minute longer. This is very important theology right here. God knows exactly how many days and how many seconds each of us will be on the earth. He is sovereign. He is in control. Even when you're in it, when you're having a hard time, you're going through a trial, you're just being tested, and you're full of trouble, you can trust that God is going to be there on the other side and he is going to blow you away with his goodness and his faithfulness. As a matter of fact, it says, it says that when you're going through a hard time, don't give up. It says, don't stop doing what's right. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But it says here in Job 14, 13, it says, I mean, Job's desperate at this point. Okay. He is absolutely at the lowest. And he goes, I wish you would just hide me in the grave and forget me there until your anger is past. But uh, <laughs> mark, your, mark your calendar and think about me again. He's like, I just want to just hide in the grave, but don't forget me forever. Like he just wants to disappear. Anybody feel like you just want to disappear sometimes. Like you're just like, I'm in so much pain. Or I am feeling so abandoned. By the way, I, I do apologize for those of you who have abandonment issues. When I was gone, I, I didn't want you to think. I mean, a lot of people have asked me if I was leaving. No, I'm not leaving, okay? FYI. Some of you are bummed. But um, anyway, <clears throat> it says, can the dead live again? If so, this would give me hope through all of my years of struggle, and I would eagerly await the release of death. I mean, this is, a, this is a theme that you find through the Bible. There are times where righteous people, godly people, despair even to the point of death. Elijah went through that. He went through a severe depression. He was just like, just, you know what, just kill me now, God. I just, I would welcome it. You know, there's a, there's a passage in 2 Corinthians where they're like, we were we were tested so severely and we went through so many difficult things that we dis we were despairing even of life itself. Basically, we, we lost all hope to live. This is part of our human condition. And if you've ever had those thoughts, don't be condemned. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. The Holy Spirit gets it. The Holy Spirit is there in the midst of our weakness and our confusion and our struggles and our pain and even in the midst of our doubts. Not that he wants us to stay there, but God understands. If you've ever had to ask God why he gets it, God gets it. He's okay. Job did. Job's kind of like, what's up with this? Here it says, um, so, so finally God speaks. You know, he lets these jokers go on forever. You know, they're just, they're all coming up with their ideas about what's happening in Job's coming back and sit, basically trying to defend himself and God. And he's saying, no, this is not happening. It says here, though, that, that um, in chapter 42, God basically, he just is like, hey, where were, where were you, Job? You know, Job's like, why, 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 why? And God's like, let me ask you this. Were you there when I decided where the storehouses of the snow would be? Were you there when I mapped out the boundaries of the, of the ocean? Basically, God's going, I'm in charge. I am in control. And again, Job didn't know the end of this story. But it says in Job 42.10, when Job prayed for his friends. Now there's a dynamic here. Okay. Cause his friends were, I mean, they were not good friends. Let's just put it that way. They were accusing him falsely. They were speculating about all these things. And, and it says when he prayed for his friend, what happened? God restored his fortunes. And in fact, the Lord gave him Twice as much as before. Some of you need to hear this today. Because you're in the middle of it and you're just so, you're just convinced, you're confused. You're convinced that God's done with you. You don't understand what he's doing. You can't imagine how a good God could allow this in your life. And yet you don't know the end of the story, do you? You don't know the end of your story. 
Start praying for your friends. Start praying for people. Start praying for your enemies. Start getting into a relationship with Jesus, like an intimate time with him. Pour out your heart to God. Talk to him. And just watch God begin to meet you in your time of need. You know, again, winter is a, is a really strange season because it looks like nothing's going on. But I, I studied a lot of um, the horticulture of what happens in winter. And there's all kinds of stuff going on under the ground. And, you know, actually a lot of animals hibernate. Don't you want to just hibernate? This is just a little aside, but I learned that black bears, while they're hibernating, give birth, lactate, and poop. Wouldn't that be nice? That's why you're sleeping? Okay, too far. But there are these, there are these roots. They're called rhizomes. And I, Brian Tennyson is a fantastic gardener. He would be able to explain this to you more. But, but they spread out. And, they, and then eventually then they start to go back under the ground. And all kinds of things are happening. This is where seeds are, seeds receive their n- nutrition and all kinds of things are happening. So if you're in the middle of winter, take heart. Don't lose hope. God is for you. God is with you. He is going to restore your fortunes. He is going to give you twice as much as you had before. And I'm not just talking about money. So for those of you who are greedy, there's other things going on. God is not always talking about cash. For some of you, it might be. But the fortunes are talking about peace with God and and being in right relationship with him. And I have to move on. So spring, I'm not going to go on as long about the other three, but Spring is a time where you're, you're planting seeds, right? Those of you who garden, it, this is a time in spring where there's, it's been barren for a long time. All of a sudden, you plant seeds. And it says in Hosea 10, 12, this is the spiritual parallel to this. It says, plant the good seeds of righteousness. And get this. And you will harvest a what? A crop of love. That sounds like a good promise. What is righteousness? Righteousness just means doing the right thing. Doing what Jesus would do. Loving people the way Jesus would love them. You know, our society is so divided right now over so many things. Yes? If you're still awake, can you nod your head? Our society is so divided right now. And I just want to challenge us. As the body of Christ, we are supposed to be set apart and known by our love and known by our grace. Okay? Yes? Not again? Okay. Plant the good seeds of righteousness and reap a harvest of love. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts. I just want to say maybe the hard ground of your hearts is like you're, you've decided where you stand politically and everybody else is wrong and you're not going to accept people who don't believe just like, Mm-mm, that's not the heart of Jesus. Or the hardness of your heart m- might be that you have bitterness against someone and you refuse to let go. You refuse to forgive them. Again, please keep in mind, forgiveness is not for their sake. Forgiveness is for your sake. And in the same manner in which you forgive, you will be forgiven. Jesus says, you can, you can mess yourself up by bitterness. Bitterness is, is, I think there are two things that are attacking the church right now. Bitterness, unforgiveness toward people, just not wanting to let go. And number two, division. And I believe that the Holy Spirit wants us as the Adventure Church as individuals, to repent for that, to ask for forgiveness if there's any of that in us. If you have bitterness, it says if you have anything against anyone, you need to forgive them. And sometimes you need to go to them, but don't go to them until you've forgiven them. Never confront somebody in your bitterness because you won't see them clearly. Okay? That's just a principle. Okay, so... Now is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. Some of you are in the middle of spring. You're planting seeds. You're ready to go. You're like, God, show me. Show me what you have for me. I'm ready. I'm ready to start digging stuff up and planting seeds, okay? And then there's summer. 
Now, summer is a time, it says they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. Summer is a time of preparation. It's a time of waiting. But then all of a sudden you start to see the fruit come up. This is a time where you start to see, um, as I mentioned, Brian, he planted a bunch of uh, produce in my flower beds. And now it's so fun because the produce is starting to become ripe. As a matter of fact, last night I ate an entire butternut squash for dinner. It was so good. <laughs> That's all I had for dinner. So, but um, but isn't it isn't summer the time where you're like oh, you go out and like oh on your tomato plant there's there's a ton of tomatoes there but they're not quite ripe. And like the sons of Issachar, you have to know what season you're in so you know how to respond. Some of you. Try to make things happen on your own, and you're not waiting on the Lord. You're not waiting for God to lead you and guide you. You're just sick of waiting. So you're just going to go make it happen. Not a good idea. Ask Abraham and Sarah about the whole Hagar thing. Not a good idea. Wait on the Lord. Summer is a time you're waiting for things to grow. You're waiting for them to become ripe. Okay, and if you're one of those people, you know, there's the two kinds of people, the go people and the woe people. There's the people you have to go, go, and then there's the people you got to tell, whoa. People, the woe people don't do well in summer. (laughs) The woe people don't like to wait, but wait on the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings as eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. That's a good promise for those of you who are woe people. (laughs) Autumn is a time where harvest and celebration, it's a time of hard work, but it's a time where everything is ripe. There's an overabundance of things. And that is a time, that's why I think so many people like autumn. 1 Corinthians 9.10, wasn't he speaking to us? It was written for us, so the one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might expect to sh- both expect a share of the harvest. Autumn is the time where you can expect a share of that harvest. And this is why going back to spring, it says plant seeds of righteousness. You know, there is reaping and sowing. It, it's saying that, that whatever you plant in the ground is going to come up eventually. It's going to yield a harvest. So you want to make sure you're planting good seeds so that come autumn, you have a harvest. Which leads me to, I really believe that one of the things that the Holy Spirit has been impressing upon my heart, and I've mentioned it before, but I really believe, as I mentioned, co uh, What's it called again? COVID. Um, (laughs) Haven't heard the word enough. Um, COVID has messed us up relationally. I think COVID has, has done more to isolate people, to cause fear in people, and to uh, separate people than anything else we have ever seen in our lives. And I really believe that the Holy Spirit is saying, I want you to love me and love one another. I really believe this is a time for us to begin to connect relationally in a deeper way. To have real talk with people, real conversations, to let people really know you. And I know this is terrifying for you, for some, especially if you're an introvert. Because you're like, am I going to have to go to every party? No. (laughs) Introverts, relax. One-on-one. Do a Bible study with someone. You know, get involved. I mean, we're going to do a rollout on a new, our community groups in the fall. Community groups are really at the heart of the, the relationships and the life of the Adventure Church. If you're not in a community group, you're really missing out on, on the, a, a family kind of that family atmosphere. Or um, we're going to start classes. As uh, Eli and Kristen mentioned, we're going to start classes in September where you can learn more about the Bible. You can begin to develop relationships with people. Um, today, after church, we're having a pastor's brunch. If you are new you've never, or, or you've never gone to a pastor's brunch, we want to just invite you to come and hang out with us. Um, Start to do, just 
any kind of relationship things because it's so significant. We love God and we love people. Actually, through relationships is really where our true Christianity is tested. Because it's easy to go up on the top of a mountain and love God. Yes? It's, it's where we're tested, where forgive one another, overlook one another's offenses, you know, um, serve one another. These are the things that are, that's where we're really tested in our relationships. And I just want to say, because COVID, I, I, I just believe that there's three, three particular spirits that like to travel together. It's fear and isolation and rejection. Those three spirits like to work on people. So, so you isolate yourself, then you start to become fearful. And when you're fearful, you start to become rejected. So you isolate yourself more, and then you become more fearful. Or you, you know, do you hear what I'm saying? It's like, be careful. Isolation can really mess you up. There, there's a reason that they have solitary confinement as the worst form of, pun- well, there's capital punishment, but solitary confinement is a, is a terrible form because people literally go nuts being alone. Introverts are thinking, that'd be sweet, only for a while. <laughs> you would start to miss people. And, and you know, so I want to just say another thing about seasons of your life. Um, I saw a really tragic thing yesterday. I was at a restaurant and I saw this young man, young dad, with his probably 10 or 11 year old boy. And they were sitting at lunch and the dad did not look up from his phone one time to talk to his son who was sitting right in front of him. And I just want to say, not as a, a point of condemnation, but as a, just, a, just learn from my mistakes, because I think I spent way too much time on my phone. I missed out on a lot of really good con- contact with my own kids. But if you have young children at home or teenagers, put your phone down and engage. You know, kids spell love, T-I-M-E. And you know that season, you always hear when you have a new baby, oh, that season, they're, they're going to grow up so fast. And you're always like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, they are. That season is a blip. Seeing that little boy with his dad, and the little boy is just by himself, just eating. I just thought that's really a statement on our culture right now. Please put your phone down. Have, have a no phone at the table rule when you eat dinner or something. I mean, not to get legalistic, but relationships are where we are, we are fulfilled and restored in Christ. Okay? So, you know, we go through chronological seasons. We go through different physical seasons. We go through different emotional seasons, like the, you know, there's a time to grieve and a time to dance. We go through spiritual seasons, the, the wilderness, the winter. We go through the spring, the time of investment and, and pouring into other people. We go through summer, which is the waiting. And then we go through harvest, which is bringing in the produce, bringing in all of the fruit of our labors. And whatever season you're in, let the Holy Spirit show you. You know, for some of you young moms who are staying home with your kids, you're feeling this, like, ah, I need to, I need to do more. No, you don't. You need to be with your babies. And I'm not trying to make an excuse. I mean, if you're just sitting there just, you know, watching soap operas all day, then maybe <laughs> you might want to let someone else watch your kids. But I'm just saying, you know what? That time is going to go so fast. So parents, please don't miss out on the opportunity to invest in the lives of your kids. That was just for free. And I just want to say this too. It doesn't matter how old you are. God does not care about your age, but he cares about your level of openness and commitment and maturity. You know, there are, there are people that are very old that are not wise. They haven't become wise. You become wise through spending time with the all-wise God. Spending time. I I heard a quote by Amy Simple McPherson, who is the founder of of Foursquare, and she said that when you talk to God, or when you pray, you're talking to God. 
But when you read the Bible, God's talking to you. I love that. So what season are you in? What are you supposed to be doing right now? Are you supposed to be just trusting? Are you supposed to be investing? Are you supposed to be waiting? Or are you supposed to be bringing in the produce? What is God doing in your life right now? And what are the implications of that? What does that mean going forward? This is just between you and your maker. So if if we could stand together, I'm just going to pray for you. And then I want to give opportunity to anyone who doesn't have a clue what I'm talking about with this relationship with God. I would like to give an opportunity for anybody that doesn't know Jesus. If you've never been born again, today's the day. So, Father, we come before you. We thank you that you are a a God of seasons. Lord, you created the seasons. And, Lord, we want to understand the times and the seasons so that we know the best course for our future. And so, Father, we we just look to you, God. Right now, I just want to pray for those who are in the middle of winter. They're discouraged, maybe frustrated, confused, feeling abandoned. Lord, but I know there's so much going on underneath the surface. I just pray you'd give them strength, Lord. I know right now that there are those who are in the middle of spring, and they feel like it's a time for them to just start to invest, to pour into other people, to pour into their relationship with you. And I just ask God you would give them the strength that they can actually receive a crop of love. Lord, and for those who are in summer, they're waiting patiently. They're maybe a little uncomfortable. They feel the heat. God, their strength is being zapped. But they look and they see that there's hope. I pray you would just give them the perseverance to continue to wait on you. And Lord, for those who are in harvest season in autumn, Lord, I pray that they would have a great time of rejoicing and celebration. Lord, they would recognize what you're doing in their lives right now, Lord. And I do pray for the Adventure family. Father, I pray for unity. I just stand against a spirit of division that wants to come in and divide relationships and divide families even. And I just ask God that each one of us would have an overabundance of grace and love for one another. Lord, that we would, we would put aside our differences. We would focus on the thing we have in common, which is you which is found at the foot of the cross. Lord, and I just pray for your blessings on this group, on these people in the name of Jesus. Amen. And if you are a person and you have never come to know Jesus, I just, um, I want to ask if, if you would come and talk to me afterwards. And I love you guys. God bless you. If you don't know Jesus, come and talk to me and I'll tell you more about how awesome he is. God bless you guys.